Hi, I'm your host Terry Dunn, and you're listening to episode 3 of Divided Land, and I'm presenting on some of the research I carried out as Leash Historian in Residence in 2021 and 2022. In previous episodes, we were in Clonaslee in 1918, and then in Collection in April 1920, and the Republican or Separatist movement was encouraging agrarian protest. We are going to see in this episode how the policy changes from encouraging to discouraging, and the main part of that discouraging is setting up an alternative legal system, which was one of the main pillars of the alternative Republican counterstate. In this episode, we're moving further into 1920, and we're going to be in the hinterland of Mount Rath. We're going to be looking at two court cases to do with land disputes. One in the Dáil or Sinn Féin system, and one in the old United Kingdom system. This is all brought to you through Leash County Library with the support of the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gwaltot Support and Media, as well as with Leash County Council under the community strand of the Decade of Centenaries programme. And there has to be a big thank you as well for James, our producer, as well as producing the podcast. James made the trailer for this podcast series. If you haven't seen the trailer, you should check it out. It's really good. And you can see more of James's work at scampmedia.ie. We'll start off with the big picture as to what was going on in the spring of 1920. And what you're going to hear now is part of the Royal Irish Constabulary Inspector General's report for March 1920. So what was summarised by the head of the RIC based on the reports he had from each county and he was summarising them for further up the chain of command. This is the report then for March 1920. State of Kings County was on the whole fairly peaceable, though there were a number of raids for arms. No attacks on police barracks or police. The same remarks apply to Queens County, but there was considerable agrarian unrest about Boris and Ossery and Rathdowney. This has taken the form of repeated cattle drives but a large number of persons have been arrested and prosecuted. Sinn Féin activity has been mainly confined to raiding for arms. So that was the picture the Royal Irish Constabulary had. As I was saying in previous episodes, despite the commencement of tenant purchase, there was still the continued presence of discontented groups, such as so-called uneconomic smallholders and the descendants of evictees, and non-inheriting sons. Then there was so-called unpurchased tenants, who still had a landlord, and finally farm workers. We're going to meet examples of all these groups in this and upcoming episodes. There was also a developing power vacuum. The government was closing down smaller police barracks and concentrating the Royal Irish Constabulary in larger stations, which would be harder for the Irish Republican Army to attack. This was one of several own goals scored by London in the period. What happens in April 1920, as I was saying in the previous episode, is unoccupied or partially unoccupied police barracks are attacked by Republican insurgents. This went on across the country. So, for clarity, the barracks were being closed down as barracks, but were sometimes still used for residential purposes by a small number of RIC men or their spouses. On the 3rd of April 1920, Locally, the income tax office in Mount Melek and eight RIC barracks were subjected to arson. That's uh, Ballinakill, Ballyrowan, Castletown, Coolrain, Dunan, Lugger Curran, the one in the heat, and finally the one in Timahoe. They came back to finish a job in Ballinakill on the 14th of April and then went out the heat and uh, Timahoe again in May. Uh, in the attempted burning um, in Lugger Curran, IRA volunteer John Byrne of Gracefield Bally Linen, uh, suffered burn wounds from which he died. Then Clannis Lee Barracks was burnt on the 14th of April, Ballacolla on the 17th of April, um, in June one near Port Tarrington, and then Arrow on the 18th of June. That's just Leash. The same phenomenon was replicated across the country. Then as well as that you had the resignations and recruitment crisis in the Royal Irish Constabulary. By the summer of 1920 there was a weekly average of 52 resignations compared to an average of only seven enlistments. Those are Sean Gallant's figures. And altogether, by the middle of June 1921, there were almost 2,000 resignations from the RIC. That's Arthur Mitchell's figure. Then you had an increasingly military uh, presence on the part of the British state. 
So this is when Dunhamore Workhouse, um, in this summer, 1920, would have been taken over and used as a temporary military barracks by the British Army. Now, before all this, there was improvised Republican arbitration courts and improvised Republican policing. Uh, and, and indeed, we might say the impetus for an alternative court system goes back long before this, to earlier decades. But it's the crisis in the spring and early summer of 1920 that really brings it to another level. And that crisis is a combination where you have, as I've been saying, much less of a Royal Irish Constabulary presence and a new movement of cattle driving. That's particularly on the East Connick Plain, East Galway, Roscommon and South Mayo. But there's certainly the potential to spread from there and to some degree the actuality of the movement spreading from there. So we're going to see it now going on in the western part of the leash. I always like to present what was said at the time. So in a moment we'll have Arthur Connor's explanation as to the development of the dog courts. But first a bit on who Arthur Connor was. Well, he was the TD, the Member of Parliament, for Kildare South, though he was actually from Salvage in the north of the county. And he was acting Minister for Agriculture. And later, from August 1921, he was the full Minister for Agriculture. So this is Minister for Agriculture now in the separatist government, the underground separatist government, set up by people who had been elected to the Parliament in Westminster, but set up their own separatist assembly called the Dáil. And then from August 1921, he was the full Minister for Agriculture. And he was a substitute earlier because Robert Barton, who was actual Minister for Agriculture, was in prison. Anyways, Ed O'Connor made a report to the Dáil, that's the separatist parliament, on the 17th of August 1921. And this is what he said. Shortly after I took up my duty in the department, the land trouble in the West became very acute and reports were reading an alarming state of affairs there flowed daily into my office. Presently, large numbers of terrified landowners came up to the city for the purpose of seeking interviews with responsible Republican officials and beseeching the Dáil for aid and protection. It is a curious anomaly that those aggrieved landholders, mostly persons with strong British sympathies and hence opposed to the Republic, were actually the first section of the community to advocate strongly the setting up of a judiciary responsible to Andal. Now that's an important point, and I'll return to it in conclusion. Yeah, it's an important point that this these Dáil courts are establishing a, a new relationship between Sinn Féin on the one hand and people who would have been more inclined towards Southern Unionism, who wanted to maintain the union with Britain. On the other hand, yeah, so this is a new relationship. And then Arthur O'Connor goes on to talk a bit about Kevin O'Shiel. Now, Kevin O'Shiel's witness statement to the Bureau of Military History is an essential source, um, and on this, but anyways, Art, Art goes on. I issued a warrant to Kevin O'Shiel as a special commissioner, authorising him to arbitrate on all matters relating to disputes about land within the purview of this ministry. He went throughout the country hearing and determining cases. During the months of May, June and July, and part of August, he was engaged practically every week in holding land courts in the troubled areas. He sat in Ballinasloe, Clare Morris, Ballyhonis, Roscommon, Castle Ray, Mullingar, Castle Pollard, Burr, Port Leash, Tullamore, Grenard, Longford, Manor Hamilton, and occasionally in Dublin. So that's what Art O'Connor had to say in August 1921. So that gives us some idea of the geographic spread. What you've got there is the West. And some ways into the North Midlands, some of the more northerly parts of Leinster. It's actually pretty much the same spread as the Ranch War in the first decade of the 1900s. And it's, it's basically it's the beef corridor from the west over to Mead. Though there are some absences there, uh, for one Mead itself and Clare as well. Um, the geography of it is interesting. As I alluded to in the first episode, there were clearly distinct agricultural regions. And... What I described there was one or perhaps two of them, the area with the speciality in beef, and different patterns of collective action reflect these regional patterns of production, uh, which is actually why Leash is particularly interesting as a place to investigate all this. The county kind of sits in the middle of these different regions and experiences some crossover with an interesting mixture of different movements as a result. So that's one interesting aspect of what Arthur Connor had to say, and We'll go back to another aspect to repeat it again. It's quoting Arthur Connor now. 
Dáil Minister for Agriculture. It was a curious anomaly that those aggrieved landholders, mostly persons with strong British sympathies and hence opposed to the Republic, were actually the first section of the community to advocate strongly the setting up of a judiciary responsible to one Dáil. So it is actually, to some extent, Southern Unionists who were pushing for the Dáil courts. And that is a really important fact. It speaks to two things. One, the class nature of Sinn Féin, or at least the Sinn Féin leadership, in that here they will be organising the defence of the haves and the have-nots. But also we have to think of the political um, impact of this new relationship, which I will return to at the, at the very end. And so we're going to look at now is uh, two cases that went on near Mount Rath, a uh, Derry Nasira and a Krana. Um, and we're going to have details of a, of a, a case that was heard in the Dáil courts and a case that was heard in the in the in in, in the um, UK court. So there was a Dáil court sitting in Port Leash on the fifteenth of September, nineteen twenty. And Kevin O'Shiel, who we just heard Arthur Connor talk about, what was the was the guy sitting as judge? So John F. Hogan of Large Hill, Mount Rath, was seeking an injunction against Patrick Cuddy and Edward Phelan from interfering in his workings of the lands of Spruce Hill, also known as Derry Nasira, while Cuddy and Phelan were claiming portions of the lands as descendants of tenants who had been evicted from those lands. So first we're going to hear Hogan's version of events. Yeah, that's John F. Hogan of Large Hill, Mount Rath. And this is how it was reported. His cattle were driven this year and other farms in that district were attacked. The cattle were driven four or five times. A wall was knocked down and a gate smashed and wire was cut. He stopped one of the men one day. He would not let him out with the cattle. Then he referred the matter to the Republican court. So again, this is this cattle driving tactic where people are, are, are driving cattle off land that they maintain they have a have a right to. Now Mr Hogan, this is how this is how his land ownership is presented, shall we say. A little later on we're gonna find out that things may be a little different, okay? But for the time being we'll go we'll 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 go with this uh with this uh, presentation. So Mr Hogan has forty acres at Larch Hill, a hundred and forty two acres in Derry Nasira and another 40 acres up near Bar Sinossary. And if we remember back to the first episode, the majority of farms in Leash were under 30 acres. Yeah. So th this is a significant size of, size of a farm. He also has a small pension from the army, drawn a uh, hundred pounds a year. Uh, presumably he had been in the 1914, 1918 war. Because, as far as I can see from the census, uh, he was 18 in 1911. It was Hogan's father who came into Derry Nasira and then later Larch Hill. Okay? And it tr seems that Hogan's father, who was Eugene Francis Hogan, was the dispensary doctor in Mount Rath. That's the kind of doctor under the public health care system. And the local government board was a bit upset with him for living outside of the dispensary district. So it seems he thought that Derry Nasira could be a place for him to build a house. Now, Eugene Francis Hogan had actually been involved in setting up the uh, Irish volunteers in the area. And he died in 1914 or thereabouts. Now, the Freelands and the Cuddies had been evicted from their holdings in Derry Nasira in 1874. Okay, so before... Eugene Francis Hogan showed up in the scene. In the words of their counsel, Houlihan, they were, quote, owing not a penny of rent, having receipts for rent on the days they were evicted. Ned Freeland was born in 1868 on what was to become the evicted farm, and he'd been working in Guinness Brewery now for 28 years. Then Patrick Cuddy described himself as the son of the tenant. He was actually the grandson. His father was 10 at the time of the eviction, but that was the way Patrick Cuddy put it. He described himself as, quote, a common workman. He had no land. And then he actually put it that, I worked for my mother. I live in my mother's house. 
She has about 20 acres of land. And then he further clarifies, I am the youngest. My brother has the farm. So what he is then is a, a non-inheriting son. Yeah, I mentioned at the start that this was a discontented group. People who were from farming backgrounds, but who weren't going to be inheriting the farm. He goes on to say, I took part in the cattle drive. I don't know anything about threatening notices that Mrs. Hogan got, which is actually the only mention of threatening notices. Uh, I suppose the implication there is that cattle drives are an acceptable way of getting your point across and threatening notices perhaps less acceptable. Just note there for a minute that there's actually a reference there to a Mrs. Hogan. Yeah. Most of the talk here has been about a, a different Hogan, the, 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 the one that was the um, army veteran. But we'll get back to Mrs. Hogan. A further aggrieved party was a James Gilburn. Now, what happened with James Gilburn was that his father's sale of his holding in Derry Nisira had been preempted by the landlord in the early 1890s, shortly before his father died in 1894. I think there was what was happening there is that their mother was being left with a brood of small children and they were trying to get rid of some of their holdings to make ends meet in the circumstances. I'm guessing the father was ill before he died. Or their sale of the holding because you could sell the tenant's interest or tenant's goodwill, yeah? But in this case, it seems that the landlord stepped in and prevented that, okay? By 1920, Gilburn had about uh, 60 to 70 acres and was making his claim for his brothers, saying, quote, they were living at home with him and working on the farm. So again, this is non-inheriting siblings here. It transpires further that Gilburn was actually a man of some means. He had two places bought out under the Land Act, which had belonged to an uncle, and he had bid uh, 2200 for John Tracy's farm in Tenekill about a year and a half previous. So, to understand what's going on here, we have to go all the way back to the 1870s, when the ancestors of all these people were actually there in Derry Nasira. Uh, the landlord, then, in the newspaper reports from the time, is often said to be George Whitford. But he is also described as acting on behalf of his sister, Miss Harriet Whitford. So maybe that she's the actual owner. Uh, we'll see this gender dimension again. It transpires that subsequent to the evictions of the Phelans and Cuddies he was shot at, not killed, only injured. He also had to pay a compensation to the Cuddies and Freelands under the uh, Landlord and Tenant Act 1870 which allowed tenants to claim for compensation for unexhausted improvements or for the disturbance or damages of being evicted for any reason other than non-payment of rent. The shooting was just a few weeks after their case had been heard in the quarter sessions in Boris and Ossery. Then there was a further tragedy connected with all this that was reported in the Freeman's Journal on the 2nd of May 1874. And this is the Freeman's Journal report. On Monday last, the police entered the house of a man named Hegarty, in the neighbourhood of Mr. Whitford's residence, searching for arms, and on announcing their business and the fact that Mr. Whitford had been shot in the previous evening. Hegarty's wife dropped down and expired before they left the house. She was previously subject to a palpitation of the heart. Yesterday evening, one of the six men now in jail on suspicion, Fenton Phelan, the second uh, tenant evicted by Mr. Whitford, was admitted to bail, the news of his arrest having such an effect on his wife as to bring on premature confinement, and she is also at this time dangerously ill. Moving on from the exact details of what was going on in the 1870s, a lot of what the court sitting in September 1920 revolved around was whether or not there had been continual opposition over the Derry Nasira lands, or whether it had died down and so the Hogans come in unopposed and consequently could not be faulted. That's to say, the lands were no, if whether or not the lands were no longer boycotted by the time Eugene Francis Hogan arrived in 1897, which is 23 years after the original events, though of course not as long after what had happened with the Gilberts. Now, as it happened, and as Judge Kevin O'Shea made plain in the court, the Dáil had declared in June 
the 29th, 1920, the no land claims on the grounds of prior eviction would be heard, at least at present. Only claims based on the claimants being in a situation of want, having an uneconomic holding or being landless, and that those claims, even those claims, would not be heard in respect of, quote, farms and holdings which are being used and worked by the occupier as dairy or agricultural residential holdings. So, any land claims would only be tolerated if they were coming from uneconomic smallholders and only being made about farms that were these so-called ranches with beef cattle, maybe non-residential farms, so it's a, a second farm owned by someone who has a farm somewhere else, or were maybe the so-called 11-month holdings, which were so-called untenanted land. Now, that ruling would seem to rule out the Daring Nasira case, but O'Shield hears it nonetheless. And it's of interest in what reveals the circumstances of different people, which some of which we've already seen. And it's also of interest as to what may have went on or may not have went on in connection with the lands over the decades. There are two witnesses in regard to all this. Speaking mostly in Hogan's favour was Patrick Kelly who was successively secretary of the Camros branch of the National League, the National Federation and the United Irish League from the years 1887 to 1907. Uh, he may have also been a Coolrain Rural District Councillor. And then speaking in Cuddy and Phelan's favour was Thomas Phelan, who was secretary of the United Irish League in 1910. So this is what seems to have gone on in previous decades, insofar as we can ascertain from from what's claimed in the court. There had been boycotting for a long time over this land. There was no objection to Hogan in 1897. Hogan had consulted Kelly, this guy who was the secretary of the Camrush branch of the National League and the United Irish League and so on and so forth. And Hogan was directed, this is according to Kelly, to the parish priest, but then it seems the issue was raised in 1907 and was raised again in 1910, yeah, in the particular context of the ranch war, yeah, in the particular context that there was this national agitation going on. So then the point made by Hulahan, who was the counsel for Freeland and Cuddy, was that there wouldn't be opposition when an agitation had died down and the league was dormant, as was the case in 1897 when um, Hogan came into the lands. Now, it's also interesting here that you have the Sinn Féin court referring back to the decisions made by United, the United Irish League, by United Irish League meetings. So you can kind of see that, on the one hand, the Dáil courts are an innovation, but on the other hand, they are, they're an innovation because they're connected to an alternative government that's claiming to be the legitimate authority, the legitimate national authority, but on the other hand, they are also fitting in to an older tradition of alternative forms of arbitration. Now, the decision went in Hogan's favour. So the decision went in Hogan's favour, and one of the interesting things about the report as to the ruling being in Hogan's favour is that it was actually Mrs. Hogan who was the actual landowner while earlier references were to her, to her son, much like way back in the 1870s, it seems to have been a sister who was the actual owner, but the brother who was performing the public roles. It's like every so often women who on the surface seem not to be present make a sudden unexpected uh, unexpected appearance. Um, because in these instances, land holding was bound up with social roles that were gendered as male. So that was our case the Daring Asira case are an example of a case within the Dahl Courts. Then we're going to look at the Crana Cattle Drive. And this is this was a trial in the British system, the UK system, not a Republican court as with the Daring Asira case, but it is interesting in that some of the same type of evidence as to the justification of the cattle drive comes up in both. This was about a drive that took place on the 13th of March, 1920. So this is what Joseph Delaney who was the man 
whose cattle were being driven had the same court. On the 13th of March, I was in my house. When, hearing the sound of cattle, I went to the door and saw 16 head of cattle and two horses, my property, in the yard. When I last saw these cattle and horses at 5 p.m. the previous evening, they were on my farm at Cranon. With the cattle in the yard were John Hond, George Hond of Derry Canton, and Dennis Doyle of Dysart Bay. Also at the gateway in the yard were Thomas Hond of Derry Canton and James Farrell of Coote Street, Mount Raff. John Hond said, put back those cattle no more. I replied, as soon as I'm ready I will put them back and did so in about half an hour after. So that was what Joseph Delaney had to say in court about the events of the 13th of March 1920. About 26 years previously, Joseph uh, Delaney's father, who was from Ballyhuran, purchased for about one and a half years rent, I think that means purchased the leasehold, 42 acres in Cranor from the chemist's estate. And John Holland of Derry Canton was evicted for non-payment of rent in Cranor. Delaney already had 20 acres in Ballyhuran, so that would have been around 1894 or so. The claim was made that Father Fian, parish priest of Castletown, had negotiated a settlement back at that time. So the accused were Dennis Doyle, an employee of Holland's, James Farrell, a blacksmith described as a good neighbour, that's the fellow from Coote Street, and James Holland the son, and John Holland the father. Doyle Farrell and the younger Holland were sentenced to an undertaking of good behaviour and to probation. The older Holland was sentenced to the same but refused to accept it and was given three months in the joy with a send-off. So this was the send-off, quoting the newspaper report here. During the proceedings, the town was enlivened by the music of the Ross Kelton Fife and Drum Band, which subsequently played Mr. Holland to the railway station, where he was given an enthusiastic send-off to Mount Joy. But negotiated settlements could be made in the official court system too, as happened in the Laberton case, which... I opened this series where it features in the, the, the trailer film. In that instance, while people were being sentenced for cattle driving off on one side of the court, negotiations were taking place over access to the land, informally the other side of the court. So that, as I say, was in the, the, the trailer film at the start of the, the series, and it was a cattle drive that happened just south of Port Leach in May 1917. There were settlements made on a local voluntary basis outside of any state control and it's really is that practice that the Doyle courts are engaging with and trying to build on or use. So that was one context to the doll courts and Republican policing. The most important one, in my opinion. But as well as cattle driving, there was also what we might call ordinary decent crime and a lot of it. So... There are two fatal casualties listed for the Mount Rath area in the recent book, Dead of the Irish Revolution. One of them, Peter Keyes, an alleged informer shot dead by the Irish Republican Army on the 5th of July 1921. The other, Michael Byrne, the victim of an armed robbery. He was a cattle dealer and believed to be in the habit of carrying large sums of money. I suppose the question might be why include Byrne? He wasn't a victim of political violence carried out either by the state or by insurgent forces. That is one way of thinking about it. Uh, but I actually, and I actually don't think the book systematically includes non-political killings. But the context of the increase in ordinary decent crime was the context of the broader revolution. So in that sense... Michael Byrne was one of the dead of the Irish Revolution. There was an especially big crime wave in the truce period and also in the early Civil War. In the truce period, it's just often not clear who was in charge. So you had British authorities mobilise against Republican courts, as happened to Boris and Ossery in December 1921. So as an example of what was going on um, at the time, in the way of ordinary decent crime, this is a report from the local newspaper of April 29th, 1922. Uh, Pym and Sons establishment in O'Connell Square, Mount Rath, was entered on Saturday or Sunday night last, and a considerable quantity of goods, including boots, clothing and foodstuffs, were taken. The IR police 
that's the Irish Republic of Police, are making inquiries into the affair, but so far it is not known whether any clue has been obtained which would lead to the identity of the perpetrators. That's an example of the kind of crimes that were going on, and here's an example of the kind of punishments. In September 1921, a man was found chained to a lamppost in Boris and Ossery with the placard, Robbers Beware, Tried and Found Guilty by the IRA. So it seems, at least gone by newspaper reports, that as you go into the summer of 1920, the old court system, the British court system, has fallen into disuse. So just going to conclude with the question, why is all this important? Well, it's important in terms of how things panned out is that it was a further demonstration to London of the popular support the separatist cause had. The multifaceted land issues were of crucial importance to many people at the time and consequently the 1923 Land Act that we'll get to in a future episode played a crucial role in consolidating the new state. But specifically, the Dáil Courts also demonstrated a conservative aspect to Sinn Féin. This switch between supporting agrarian protest in 1918 and even as late as April 20, as we saw the last time in the collection case, and then stepping back from that and trying to quiet things down in spring, early summer 1920, and from then onwards. As we saw earlier from what Art O'Connor and the Dáil Minister for Agriculture was saying, made for an engagement with Southern Unionism, a different type of engagement with Southern Unionism, and it's, I think, notable that by... August 1920, a lot of conservative opinion and a lot of traditionally unionist opinion in the south of Ireland had shifted over to calling for, inverted commas, dominion home rule, which would have been along the same lines as the treaty settlement of the following year. Like the, there was a meeting of the magistrates and deputy lieutenants of the Queen's County in August 1920, which called for Dominion Home Rule. Now, I'm just going to conclude by looking at what Lord de Vesey had to say at the meeting of magistrates and deputy lieutenants of the Queen's County that put forward that call for Dominion Home Rule in August 1920, okay? And this is quoting Lord de Vesey. In his opinion, there was in Ireland today a far greater danger than Home Rule. That danger was Bolshevism. And if ever Ireland was to become a self-supporting nation, and a nation within the British Empire worthy of her name, that evil should be eradicated. To do that must take time, and would require the strongest and most united effort on the part of every level-headed Irishman. It would require the most highly tested cooperation. Before they could hope for real cooperation, they should learn to rely on and trust one another and prove that one another's trust and confidence were worthy of respect. In proposing that resolution, he trusted that they would help, that they would carry it unanimously, and so help towards the adoption of some form of government and restoration of law and order in Ireland under the British flag. If things went on much longer as they were, he was convinced it would be too late to introduce any form of government within the British Empire, and an Irish Republic would stare them in the face, and a civil war would be inevitable. So it seems to me that what Lord de Vesey was afraid of was a radicalisation within the revolution. So thanks for listening. We'll get back to more in two weeks when we'll be looking less at protests and more at some of the policy changes enacted by the state to deal with the whole problem of small so-called uneconomic farms. <laughs>